Believe it or not, this is probably a time that a lot of you that have been reading through with cover to cover have been longing for. In fact, we're in our final installment in our year-long cover to cover study. And today we wrap up the Old Testament edition. And so we're learning from the prophet Zephaniah, and I had several prophets to choose from this week, but I love the message of Zephaniah. So as you're turning there in the Old Testament, I want to interject that if you've not been able to, and by the way, Zephaniah is after Nahum and Habakkuk and Ezekiel and all those books, and it's before you get to Zechariah and Malachi, some of the last books in the Old Testament. It's kind of right in there. And if you've been kind of waiting, now is your time to jump in on cover to cover as a family and pick up in Matthew. You're just two chapters behind, so you can pick that up and start reading with us and go all the way through the end of the year. And your family will at least have gone through the New Testament with us as a congregation. Well, according to Zephaniah chapter 1, Zephaniah served as Judah's prophet during the reign of Josiah. If you remember, Josiah is the last really good king of Judah. He, he's the boy king that, that discovers the book of law and, as they're cleaning it out, and they bring it to him, and he has it read to him. And he's never heard some of these teachings found, particularly in the book of Deuteronomy. And he sees a gap there. He sees a gap between where they are and where God would have them to be as a covenant people. And he weeps. And he says, we've got to do something. And so Josiah puts all kinds of of different reforms in place, trying to help God's people to come back under the covenant that they had agreed to. So according to Zephaniah, he is probably preaching and and proclaiming during this period of time. So while preaching back then, the the prophets didn't kind of do a whole lot of different uh, stuff on the side. They cut right to the chase and told you exactly what they were thinking and, and more importantly, what God was thinking. So you can almost see Zephaniah gathering all the people together in the town square and says, gather, gather, come on in. I've got a word of the Lord, a a word from the Lord. I have to warn you, he's not all that happy. So let me tell you exactly what's going on. And so the opening chapter announces the sinners, the sentence on Judah and Jerusalem. And like we read earlier in Joel, in our, our readings, coming judgment is called The day of the Lord. So let's read that together in Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 7. Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. Skipping down to verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. Listen, the cry on the day of the Lord will be bitter. The shouting of the warrior there. That day will be the day of wrath. A day of distress and anguish. A day of trouble. A day of ruin. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and blackness. You think he's caught their attention? He says, look out. This is what God is is feeling. If you guys continue down this path, this is what's coming. And this great day of of reckoning is happening. You used to watch the old Western movies. And and you knew a big showdown was going to happen. And, and people in the town are, are gearing up for it. Sometimes they bring in a gunslinger because they knew that this great day of, of reckoning was happening. The forces of good versus the forces of evil. And so the people are, are told, you've got to get ready because this great day is coming. And it's the Lord that's going to be bringing this about. Man, that sounds just simply dreadful. Who would have been the people to kind of kindle up this, this wrath of God? Well, he kind of lists some folks out here. And first on the list is idolaters. In 2 Kings chapter 1, we, we read about the wicked king Manasseh that, that was before Josiah. And he had gone in and, and had basically tried to appease the nations around him. And, and also tried to look more enlightened by bringing in some of their gods and stuff. But un, unlike the gods before him, that had kind of put them up on the hilltop, Manasseh says, hey, drag that in. Let's put it in the temple. And we're, we're going to show how enlightened and how progressive we are. Because we're going to bring these gods in. And we'll, we'll still worship a little Jehovah. We're going to mix in some other things. So Jos- Josiah goes in and says, we've got to get rid of that. So he tore them all down during his reform effort. But according to Zephaniah 1 and verse 4, there remained this remnant group of Baal worshipers. And the Lord says, you're gone. I, I, I tried to tell you how repulsive that is. 
But yet you guys still over in secret. There's this small group of folks that says, well, I know it's not publicly. We, we can't do this in, in the temple anymore. Let's get together on our own. So there's this remnant of, of Baal worshipers. The, the text also tells us there's two other types of adulter, I mean of idolaters that they are still here. There are people in Judah who bow down on the roofs at night to the host of heaven. So they're, they're up there, and maybe they think everyone else has gone to sleep, and they kind of creep up on the roofs, and, and maybe they're laying down below the walls where people can't see them. But they're looking up in, 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 in the sky and seeing the stars and the moon and all these different things, and they're lifting up prayers to them. So they're lifting up prayers to created things instead of the Creator that put it all in place. Makes no sense. There was another group, it, it, we're told, that trying to have it both ways, they're kind of dividing their allegiance. It says, those that bow down and swear by the Lord, and, and, and are kind of saying, this, this is my standard for how I live, but also swearing by Molech, the god of the Ammonites? Why in the world were they doing this? And the Lord shares through the prophet, it's unacceptable. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to share time with anyone. I'm not. I, it's got to be all me. I, I'm not going to allow you to, to kind of do some of this and some of that and kind of piece this thing together. All of you are going to be swept away in the judgment on the day of the Lord. Well, the second group of, of folks that he mentions is those that are lovers of money, those who just relied upon their riches. And so you can imagine he's out there in the, in the square, and he's talking with all the merchants that have their, their big bags of, of silver. He says, those of you that are relying upon that, that, that love to hear that, that jingle, and, and those that are, are, are putting their prosperity before God. He also sings, singles out the, the, the princes, the, the princes that, that go in and get these foreign clothes and come back, and they're, they're the snazzy dressers. And said, you know, that's become your identity. It's, it's no longer me. And so he, he kind of singles these out. And in verse 18, it says, neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. It, it, it may provide security for right now as you're going, but on that day, <laughs> nothing's going to be worth anything. The things that you're holding on to will be meaningless. The third group is those that were self-sufficient. Ooh, this is getting a little personal because here in America, we, don't we kind of hope our kids will be self-sufficient? And we, we like kind of pulling ourselves up our bootstraps. And, and that, that's kind of an American ideal. But these folks were kind of self-sufficient in how they handled their entire life. And the, the people of Jerusalem had kind of grown into kind of moral free agents where I kind of determine what's right and what's wrong. And I'm going to kind of set the course of, of things. And I'll, I'll do a few things that, you know, out of tradition and we'll, we'll hit some of the high holy days and, and, and that type of stuff. But other than that, I, I'm going to kind of determine. I'm the one that's got the reins here. So Zephaniah 3 and verse 1 and 2 says, Woe to the city of oppressors, the rebellious, and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. God has no voice in, into what I'm doing. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. So, sometimes that love of money uh, kind of ties into that. If you've got things under control financially and, and, and you're set, is it harder to trust in God to re allow him to have the reins when, you know, by the world standards, you've got things going. So these people have become self-sufficient. And so if we're self-sufficient, it really is difficult for us to draw near to God if you're relying upon yourselves. And, you know, th this may seem like kind of an inconsistency, that you've got these, these people that, that are keeping God at arm's length with their self-sufficiency, but at the same time, they're kind of grasping after idols. I mean, e either you're independent or you're dependent. But in reality, these aren't competing, but in, in, in reality, there, there is inside of every human being a deep longing for something greater than themselves. Uh, something to admire, something to worship, something to hold up, and we, we want to praise something. But on the other hand, we kind of like this whole autonomy thing. We, we like setting our, our own course, and we, we love you know, kind of having this power thing. Uh, we, we, we like to admire and worship something, but we also want to control things. And so by worshiping Yahweh and Molech, 
in reality, it's not working. They're, they're worshiping neither. What they're attempting to do was to, create, to craft this kind of deity blend that would make them feel good about themselves by, by worshiping Yahweh, but also by bringing in and, and worshiping Molech, it gave them the leeway, the moral freedom, because Molech's not going to tell you what to do. So if we feel good about lifting up God, and then we mix in some Molech that, are come, well, there's no rules over here. Man, we have the best of both worlds. I love having this freedom, but also feeling good about my worship. So believe it or not, this notion is very popular today. In a recent Bravo entertainment um, interview with actress Halle Berry, she was asked about her religious views. And here's a couple excerpts from what she had to say. She said, I'm, I'm not really religious, but I'm spiritual. I, I, I grew up in the Baptist church. That's kind of my heritage. But I also visit synagogues from time to time. You know, I, I dabble in Buddhism, and, and I name my daughter after a Muslim name. And, and though I'm open to a lot of things, I don't connect on a deep level with any of them. As far as practice, I mainly meditate to a higher power. You see how you're kind of doing some of this stuff, kind of pulling this together? I, I don't want to sound judgmental. Believe it or not, I haven't met Halle Berry and, and talked with her about this. But to me, if, if you're piecemealing kind of a spiritual experiences of, of various faiths and even various deities, and, and you admit you're not beholding to any, are any of them have sway over your life? No, they don't become the sinner. You become it. You kind of determine for yourself how you're going to be a spiritual person, not religious. Oh, because that's kind of not popular right now to be religious. It's, it's not popular to be part of a church, but boy, I'm spiritual. I, I'm open to a higher being. And, you know, whether I'm out in nature or down on a yoga mat, I, I can connect with something greater than me because I, I realize I, I can't do it by myself. John Piper put it this way. There may be no more arrogant man on the face of the earth than the man bowing humbly before the God he has created in his own image. So the Lord said, for those that are trying to do this, this day of the Lord is coming. This is not what I intended when we signed the covenant treaty at Mount Sinai. But when I called you out as Abraham's seed to be a people that are different in order to call the nations back to me, you're not different. You're not acting in such a way that's attractive for others to want to come to me. Perhaps the most troubling on this list is found in verse 12. It says, The day of the Lord is reserved for the complacent. Hey, why us? We're not doing anything? Exactly. You're not doing anything. You're complacent. By their practice and their complacency as, as far as their relationship with God, God becomes kind of a non-player in your life. And what I mean by that is, when verse 12 it says, um, the Lord will do nothing either good or bad. So what, what that means is, well, I, I kind of believe in God, but you know, I'm going to worship him time to time. Huh, I'm not going to get off the couch for him. Because you know why? I don't think God's gotten off the couch for me. I, I don't see him really in my life, so why should I do something and, and make that a, a bigger part of, of how I react to it? So I'm just going to take a step back. If people ask you, yeah, I believe in God. How it's played out in my life? Well, I'm just going to be kind of complacent about it. In chapter 2, after calling these folks out and prophesying about the day of their demise, here's where it gets exciting. The prophet also calls another group to gather around. I, I imagine he kind of dismisses those. And, and as they're in the marketplace talking, and one by one, as these folks said, okay, that's me, I'm out. Uh, I'm not going to listen to this anymore. There's another group that's still there. There's another group that he calls to gather around, gather around. It's the faithful. When this dreadful day of the Lord comes about, and the Lord fully vents his wrath, he's telling them, if you guys will stay the course, you're going to be spared. 
And this is the key verse in Zephaniah. So if you want to put a star next to it, that's great. It's Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 3. Listen to these powerful words. Seek the Lord, all of you humble of the land. Those that are still remaining here as we're talking. You who do what he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility, and perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. So Zephaniah calls the people to seek God wholeheartedly. And, 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 and here's how that works. Because, you know, you're like, okay, I, I pursue the Lord. Well, he, here's kind of a formula for you if you're like, how do I really get connected with God if, if I'm kind of complacent or I'm, have been kind of divided? But he kind of sets this out. Here's how it works. True humility it is really understanding who God is. And, and before we can under, uh, really be humble before God, we have to have an accurate picture of God. Because the, the world is telling us God's no big deal. We read in Scripture, God is a huge deal. And the more you understand about God, and the more you take Him out of the box and allow Him to be who He says He is, the more we have to take a step back and go, oh my, this is so much bigger than what I thought. No longer is it just God and I walking on the beach together. God is so much beyond that. God is so incredible. When we re- understand that, every person that had been spiritual that gets brought into the presence of God, people that are the most spiritual people around that God calls out, when they come into His presence, you think that they get it, but they're like, oh my Isaiah's, ah, I'm a man of unclean lips. Give me, give me a coal. I, I'm, I'm terrible. He's holy, holy, holy. I'm nothing. What? That's what we have to get. We have to understand who God is, and that's going to take us to our knees. True humility, admitting God's so much greater than I am. What that allows you to do is it frees you to say, I'm going to seek refuge in him. Uh, I, I'm on his team. Because the more we understand about God, the more we say, I, I, I want to be on his side. I don't want to be up against him. I want to be joining with him. And so we seek refuge in him in the storms of life. And some of you guys have been through the storms. And you know God is the only thing we can anchor into. We seek refuge in God. And, 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 to God and, we, and we sing songs about where could I go but to the Lord? Hopefully, you've gone through some valley times to where everything else you've been trying to grab hold of isn't working. And it, it humbles you to the point where you're like, the only thing I can grab a hold of is where my anchor is cast, and that's on my Heavenly Father. I'm going to seek refuge in Him because nothing else has helped me during this time of storm. When that happens... Finally, it frees us to turn and produces a righteous life. Proclaiming, my ways are going to be your ways, Lord. That's what's going on. And when it says in chapter 2 and verse 3, perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the Lord. So sometimes it makes us a little uneasy. A little uneasy. Perhaps we'll be sheltered. Well, it, it doesn't mean that God's saving work is uncertain. It, 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 what it means is our part of it depends on willingly submitting ourselves to a life of humility, as we talked about, to a life of faith and a life of righteousness. Just saying, I want to be on God's team. I'm not going to be perfect, but I want to be over here. When that happens, God takes over. In chapter 2, in verse 7 to 9, Zephaniah assures us, uh, long before they start building the siege ramps up, up on Jerusalem, there's going to be a remnant. There's going to be a, a group of people like you that's gathered around in this. There, there's going to be people that are going to make it out of this. That God's going to hold dear. He knows that there's going to be a remnant. Well, how could God, through his prophet, speak and prophesy of this remnant that's going to be there? How, how does he talk about it as if it's a done deal? This is something that we, we've, we've got to get our, our, our minds around, our hearts around. Because it's Yahweh that's going to be doing the converting. It's God, it's God that's, that's going to be changing us and is going to be molding us. And, and the Lord speaks of faithful survivors after the fall of Jerusalem. And what does he say he's going to do with these folks that have remained faithful? 
We, we hit this earlier. Ezekiel 36 and verse 26. Powerful verse. I am going to give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. It's not you getting your act together and saying, okay, God, I, I kind of cleaned some stuff up. Can I be on your team now? No, it's, it's saying, God, I got nothing. God, let me come. Great, I've been waiting for you. I'm going to take out your heart of stone. I'm going to replace that with a new spirit within you. That's going to give you the power to be a righteous people. It's going to help you. My decrees and my laws, all these things will suddenly become much easier to you when you've relinquished yourself to me. And it was through his sovereignty, grace, and mercy that he would indeed secure a remnant to carry on as his people. He said, I know what's going to happen. There's people whose hearts are right with me. So here's what we have to understand about salvation. Salvation is God initiated. God acts first. We talked about that last week. The second thing is, salvation is God supplied. It's not something we're doing. It's what God has supplied to make happen. And finally, it's God directed. We have to trust in the Holy Spirit. We have to believe in His power, not just to inspire Scripture, but to help us to grow as we release our will over a period of time. It starts here in the baptistry, but it continues on. It's God initiated, God supplied through what He did on the cross, but it's God directed. God continues to, as we release our will each and every day, God, let me live for you, no longer for myself. He does the transforming if we're just kind of humble ourselves and turn our lives over to him. My first year at college, um, at ACU, I was a freshman class officer. And part of our duties as an officer was to help with special events. And our first event that we did in the fall was a Lee Greenwood concert. Now, I know Lee's not that big a deal right now, but back then he was on his Proud to be an American tour and there was a lot of national pride and stuff. And we were really surprised we could get Lee Green would come in and do a concert. Well, the freshman class officers were, uh, designed, were asked to go and help with the food service. And so they, uh, if you've never done a big event, the guys will send in a rider, which is a contract that says you've got to have so many bottles of water and only green M&Ms, all this different stuff that you have to fulfill. And so that's all done in a green room, ready to go. So they ask us to kind of watch over the green room. And they had asked for a specific meal, so we had it ready to go. And so we're so excited. We're going to get to meet Lee Greenwood and the band. Please. It was a big deal back then. Not so much now. Okay. So we're excited. And so all this is happening. And so in comes some of the crew first. And then uh, we had uh, all the band. Everyone was there except Lee Greenwood. We're like, this is kind of disappointing. And so the concert starts at 8. So about 730 Everyone's kind of like, okay, they're done eating, and they're walking back, and we hear Lee is still doing a sound check and tweaking some things, and so just about everyone leaves. It's just me and one other person. So y'all go on to the concert. We'll clean up here. Well, five minutes after everyone leaves, who walks in? It's Lee Greenwood. It's just three of us in the room, so we have to heat up some food for him because, yeah, I'm starving. He said, have you guys eaten? We're like, no. He said, well, grab you a plate and come over. We're like, really? <laughs> so we're like, all right. So we go in and sit down. And after we get done eating, I kind of keep looking at my watch, and it's now 8 o'clock. And I'm like, okay, the kind, you know. And he's like, hey, uh, there's supposed to be some pecan pie. He goes, oh, yeah, it's over here. He's, why don't you get me a piece? And I'm like, really? You know, and so I go and cut him a piece. He goes, and, and get a piece for the two of you guys, too. And so I'm like, okay. Uh, I said, are you sure? He goes, yeah, it's my pie. You, you're welcome to have some. I said, it's not that. He goes, well, what's going on? I said, I'm afraid I'm going to be late to the concert. <laughs> he kind of grinned at me. He says, um, if you're with me, I think you're going to be just fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So I ate, ate the pie, okay? We have to understand that about our Heavenly Father. If we're with Him... Nothing to worry about. He's got a concert that he's had planned. We're not going to miss it. We're not going to miss his day of atonement. You know, the final section of this book in Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 8 through 20 is just incredible. It, it describes the glorious future of the godly after the day of the Lord. All those that have remained that he's going to restore. 
both in Israel and as John talked about in his reading, uh, all the surrounding peoples whose lips will be clean so they could come together in unity of song and proclaim the name of the Lord all together. Well, what then is it that will characterize the redeemed who are going to rejoice and, and be a part of these promises of this section? Zephaniah 3 and verse 11 through 13 says that on that day, you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you've done to me. Because I'm, I'm going to remove from this city those who rejoice in their pride. The prideful is no longer going to be here. The ones who walked away when we were talking, don't worry about them. They're going to tell you a different story. They're not even going to be here. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. I'm not going to let you back in here. But I will leave within you the meek and the humble who trust in the name of the Lord, the remnant of Israel who will do no wrong. They're not going to speak any lies. No longer are you going to hear that. Everyone's going to know who God is, what he believes, and how powerful he is. It's going to be very clear that day. You're all going to see things as I see things. In other words, the people who experience the fulfillment of the promises and, and return back to the holy hill to rebuild this temple, boy, they're going to be the ones that obey the threefold call that he talks about earlier. The humble, those that seek refuge in the Lord, and those that are purely righteous, and a righteousness that comes from God. Listen to the celebration that's going to take place on that great day. Zephaniah 3, and verse 14 and 15. Sing, O daughters of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all of your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. <laughs> He's turned back your enemy. There's no one to fear any longer. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. He says, just let it out in celebration. It's not a day to fear. It's a day we should look forward to, knowing we're with God. You know, the, this judgment that has been directed against them has, has been turned away. There's no more, any, uh, any longer any condemnation for those that are with them. Then listen to this jewel. Mark this in your scripture. Verse 16. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. Let that pour over you. He's going to take delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God is singing over us. Jesus says in Luke chapter 15 and verse 7, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous who need no repentance. I guess growing up, I just assumed it was the angels. We always hear that. Well, the angels would be singing. God's going to be singing over us. And Zephaniah tells us that when those who are repentant and humble and lowly sinners gather before God, what's he going to do? He's going to look down with disapproval. He's just going to scowl at us in our guilt. and He's going to frown in spite. He's going to look at the sheep and say, man, you are a blemished lot. How did you guys sneak past the judge? What, did did y'all come in the back gate? How did this group get together? No. That's not what's going to happen. God is the arbiter. He is the one that has put forth Christ to make us holy and presentable before him. He says, look at me. I'm the father that's welcoming you home. Get a ring for his finger and a, a robe for his back and, and kill the fatted calf. And let's throw a party because my child that was lost is now returned. My child is back home. As parents, we understand this. To have a full repentance of a child to come back. Oh, it just gets us excited. We just want to dance. We want to celebrate. We want to say, yes, it's happened. They've come full circle, back to who they were. They're back to who I intended them to be all along. One more illustration. October 24th, 1992 was a perfect day. There, it, it, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. and It was kind of a cool fall day. 
And the East Texas trees are, are incredible, and the leaves were just starting to change. And it, it was a special day. It's the day I got married. And, you know, I really, I, I knew what to expect, but I didn't know what to expect. I'd been to a lot of weddings, so I knew the drill. You kind of show up on Friday night, do the rehearsal dinner, and you do a little slideshow, and everyone's going to welcome in aunts and uncles, you know, and the whole family and friends, and it, it's kind of a celebration, and and then you go out with your groomsmen that night and kind of hang out with your buddies. And then the next day you get up and, and you go to the church and you kind of walk in and, and the sanctuary, the worship center is just really decorated up nice. You're like, oh, man, this is neat. And then you, uh, for Jill and I, we, we want to see each other beforehand. So you know, she's off on one, one part of the, the church and I'm in another part. And so we're there with the, uh, the preacher and I'm waiting for the song, you know, to come. Oh, okay, this is our song. We walk out and you, you think you're ready for it. But you're not. When that, the doors open in the back, and you see your bride for the first time in her wedding clothes, she's walking down, and it's wow, it's exciting. And you're saying, wow, this person that's walking down has said, I love you above everyone else, and I want to spend the rest of my days with you. I want to, that's the, that feeling is indescribable unless you have been there. But Scripture tells us our Heavenly Father knows that feeling. Isaiah 62 and verse 5 says, As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. We have to embrace that. How much God loves us how much he welcomes us in, how much he desires an intimacy, like no other relationship, even our spouse, that's how God wants to pull us in closer than anything else. You know, why we've been talking about the, the day of the Lord with, with Judah and specifically what was going to happen in Jerusalem, we're told there's a day of the Lord that's coming for us. A day that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, tells us that God is coming again. And it's a day that He's going to gather us home in victory. His remnant. Those that have walked through life and have said, I know there's other ways to live. And there's other ways that they're telling us to live in high school and in college and in the workforce. I've always taken a step back from that and said, you guys go on, that's not going to be me. I'm, I'm living a different way. I, I know it, it may not get me ahead, it, it may not get me a date, but th this is who I am as a person, that I've relinquished myself to God. God says, you've been faithful. You've given yourself, you said, you are going to be my people. And you're going to be my remnant for all of eternity. This is not a day to fear. It's a day that we should long for. When we talk about Judgment Day, people are like, whoa, that should be, yeah. I can't wait for God's judgment to come, for us to be with Him for all of eternity. But with that day in mind, what are we called to do? We're called, you humble of the land, to seek God with all of our hearts and to seek righteousness. Rejoice and exalt His holy name Long for it with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength. Everything is lifted up to God. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And we're going to lift up a song longing for that day and longing for His return. And Lord, hasten that return. Let's sing together. <laughs> 